Well, hello, good evening from Lake Forest, Orange County, California, in the Saddleback Valley under the shadow of uh, Saddleback Mountain. And so uh, we're here tonight and we're going to do a Bible study. Glad you're viewing uh, with us. Uh, good to have our regular viewers. And if you're brand new and watching for the first time, I, I welcome you. And we do a Bible study on Wednesday nights. And so uh, tonight I'm going to do a Bible study on one of the most beloved and most familiar passages in the Scripture. In fact, it's been called the second greatest section of the Bible after, number one, John 3.16, which most people are familiar with. I know it was the first Bible verse I ever memorized as a young adult, as a young man, brand new Christian. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And I emphasize the little word so in that magnificent, wonderful verse of 25 words in the King James Bible. 25 words. The first 12 talk about God. The last 12 talk about us. And in, in the middle is the word God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Son is the middle word. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Christ is in the middle. Every word before the word son in John 3.16 talks about God. Every word after the word son talks about you and I. Jesus Christ is the center. He's the center of everything. He's the center of creation. He's the center of time. Today it's 2021, which means 2021 years ago, approximately. Something happened. God came into this world, invaded the world and just kind of a little highlight on the incarnation god became flesh dwelt among us i want you to think of a, of a decision we always talk in our baptist churches about making a decision for christ and you know usually uh, you run into another pastor during the week they'll say hey how many decisions did you have last sunday and you know that could mean anything you could say well we had three decisions of people accepting christ or we had five decisions. Uh, five families didn't like my sermon, and they're going to leave the church. You know, a decision is a decision. But we talk about us making a decision. We are saved because of, the, of a decision that Christ, the Son of God, Christ, the second person of the Trinity, made. He made a decision to go to the cross. He said yes to the cross. But even better, before he said yes to the cross, in eternity past, the eternal Christ, the eternal Logos, or what John 1.1 1, 1 calls the Word that was with God, that was God. It says in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Logos said an eternal yes, not just to go to the cross, but think of it. He said yes to be born into this world. He said yes to become a human. We see, we see a yesness of God. And uh, a yesness of the Son, he said yes to be born. And uh, we, we, we can't fully comprehend the humiliation of the exalted, glorified second person of the Trinity from eternity past in his glorious majesty. What it meant to become human. We call it theologically the incarnation. In other words, incarnatio in Latin, incarnation mean becoming flesh becoming flesh now think about it all right i'm not going to get into details i don't want to be gross or you know puke you out tonight but imagine the very god who created the universe who in the beginning in genesis 1 1 said let there be light he spoke the word into existence when he said yes to becoming a man think of the fact that the eternal god the eternal creator had to have his diapers changed. Think of it. Think of it. He was born of a female egg, but not a male seed. He was the seed of the Holy Spirit, which means, uh, put aside all the theological mumbo-jumbo, Jesus Christ, perfect man, perfect God, all in one essence. As perfect God, he knows how to meet our need as perfect man, he knows what our need is. Theologically, it's called the hypostatic union. He was both perfect God, perfect man in, in one. And uh, a lot of her 
heretical groups deny the truth of both of those two things. So the early church, the early church, their greatest heresy was to deny the humanity of Jesus the Christ. They believed in his divinity. They believed that he was God, but they denied that he was fully man. So all these heretical teachings came about in groups that said that, well, he was a spook. He wasn't really a man. He was half man. He, he was, you know, and he, no, he is totally God and total man. The modern times accepts Jesus Christ as fully man, but denies him as being fully God. We, evangelical believers, and by the way, those of you viewing for the first few times, Arbor Christian Fellowship is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, we fellowship with them, we support their mission work, and we're proud to be Baptistic in their our belief, proud to be a Baptist myself. But... Uh, Many of the heresies that are modern deny that Jesus Christ is fully God. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, a bunch of others, the Theosophists, all kinds of groups. They'll tell you what a great man Christ was and that he's so cool. But they deny the basic truth of the Bible. Jesus is God. He's the Son of God and God the Son. Well, enough of that. Tonight our study is on Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And as I mentioned earlier... This is probably one of the greatest and most beloved and most well-known passages in the entire Bible. Next to John 3.16 is probably the most familiar with those of you who get your exercise running around in evangelical circles, in churches. Uh, it is the shepherd psalm. And I can honestly tell you, I've never done a graveside service or a memorial funeral service without somewhere in it reading or speaking a little bit on the 23rd psalm and if you stay with me for the whole half hour 20 30 minutes or whatever you'll see why so psalm 23 it's a psalm written by david who professionally uh, was a shepherd so he knew about shepherding he also knew about sheep and uh, just uh, let me tell you a couple of things biblically there's a metaphor that describes the people of god or the children of god uh, we're the people of God, we're the building of God, we're the bride of Christ, but we're also called sheep. And there's a couple of interesting things you may not be aware of uh, with sheep. Uh, first of all, sheep tend to have a mind of their own and tend to wander away from the sheepfold. And second thing about sheep is that they easily get disoriented, discombobulated, and lost. And they end up walking around in circles, and the shepherd has to go after them and bring them back. The third thing that we need to know about sheep, um, and some of this might relate to you or I or you know those of you listening, is that a shepherd sometimes has to force feed the food and the grass to the little lamb or the little sheep. They are sometimes stubborn and won't eat, and you have to force feed them. I think every mom has had some kind of similar experience there with their toddler or child or, or young one. The fourth thing about, uh, about sheep is that they have to be force-fed into a lake or river or stream or pool or pond to drink water that you know is life-saving. You can't live without water. And sometimes a shepherd has to force their heads into the water so they can lap up some of the water. So these four illusions or metaphors uh, kind of describe my experience uh, of over 51 years of being a pastor in dealing with the sheepfold of God in church. Of course, not in Arbor Christian Fellowship. These are in the other churches I pastored. I pastor a wonderful church with a great people, a very loving and mature people. And I want to tell you, they've been so kind to me even when I don't deserve their kindness. I, I, I thank God almost every day that I'm pastor at Arbor Christian Fellowship. And this, at my age, will probably be my terminal church. In other words, the last church I, I pastor, I'll either drop dead pastoring this church or retire sometime in the, in the not-too-distant future, I guess. But God bless me by letting this be the last church I pastor. God saved the best for the last. 
So if you're watching and you're in Orange County, come join us this next Sunday. We're at 2203303 El Toro Road off Muirlands. El Toro Road, our services begin at 1045 in the morning, 1045 a.m. So be glad to see you. If you come and visit, just say hi to me and say, hey, I, I saw you on Facebook. I'd love to see you. Okay, enough of that. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Let me read the psalm in its entirety, a psalm of David. Just six quick, simple verses. Uh, so much truth. Folks, it's infathomable. It's so much truth there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, by the way, I'm doing Psalm 23 today because we need the comfort of this psalm in our circumstances and situation in our nation today. There's been some confusion, there's been some insurrection, there's been some political divide, there's been some ugly stuff. We've got a pandemic, whether it's an extreme form of the flu or something different. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. All I'm going to say is uh, be careful and stay safe. And uh, so we've got all these things, and we need to step aside, and you need to hear a message from me. Uh, where instead of knocking all the bad stuff that's happening in our country is a, a message and a study of comfort and confidence. And we see this in this short little psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness by his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Uh, the, here the shepherd has two tools, a rod and a staff. Uh, I, I call it uh, the shepherd's hook and crook. By hook and crook. <laughs> uh, the crook was used to beat off wild animals, beasts, sometimes, you know, cubs, baby lions. And then the other instrument was a crook. A shepherd's staff, which had a crook at the top, which they can get uh, the errant sheep by the neck and gently draw them in or draw them back or gently draw them to the water or to the grass for them to eat. Uh, God leads us by hook or crook, <laughs> one, one or the other. Uh, so it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I, I'm, I, I hope I'm not stretching things, but wouldn't you say that today in America we are somewhat uh, living through the valley of the shadow of death? They're telling us this many million people or this have died of the COVID. And I heard today on the news, uh, if you got vaccinated, they're talking about wearing two masks and that there's new strains of the virus. Okay, I'm not going to politic. I'm not a medical doctor. All I'm going to say is, how stupid do they think we are? I'm just going to leave it at that, okay? I, I didn't mean to hurt any of your feelings. Be careful. Be safe. And I never, ever, ever would mask shame anybody. Uh, I've been wearing a mask, but I stopped wearing it because it is dangerous, because I'm breathing my own poison, and I, I tested positive for tuberculosis, so I've got weak lungs, so it's probably not... If I have to work to go somewhere to get in and this and that, of course I'll acquiesce. Okay, you know I'm not, but uh, I'll be safe and uh, you know. Uh, but what I want to get across on all this is in verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want to focus on the title of my message from Psalm 23 is the word through. Through. Andre Crouch and the disciples had a big Christian song. I mean, I heard them play it live at some concerts and speaking gigs and whatnot. Uh, it's a song called Through It All. Through It All. He leads me through it all. And some of you uh, from the 80s may remember that song. Uh, but look real closely at verse 4 at the word through. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say even though I circle around in the valley of the shadow of death. Even though I'm stuck in the valley of the shadow of death, it says, even though I walk through, it's leaving it behind and walking past all these shadows. I will say one thing. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a great British expositor of 150 years ago, said this. 
If you've been living in shadow or shadow time, you've been living in the shadows, there's no shadow unless there's a light above. There's no shadow unless there's a light above. And I would say in our context, it's the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, even though it might seem like, you know, an instrument that's blunt. And when they grab the neck to pull them back or pull them to the food or the water before they thirst to death. Uh, sometimes God's discipline is not always pleasant, but I've experienced in my life, it's certainly good for me and it's the right right thing for God to do only because he loves us and has a plan and a purpose for us and it isn't over yet he wants to use us getting to verse 5 you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies think of the term banquet okay think of this this isn't some cheap little happy meal <laughs> I mean this is like a full runway like you know some of the Thanksgiving your family has maybe you're the one that hosts the whole family all the family, the kids, the in-laws, the outlaws, and everybody else. And oftentimes, you know, the Thanksgiving table, you put several tables together. And I always used to call them at home with my mom and dad before they passed or we did the family thing. And sometimes my sisters would host, we'd host, and all. Uh, I used to call it the runway because the table seemed like a runway. <laughs> I said, you can land a jet airplane on this table once you knock all the food off. Uh, this, what Christ here represents as the bread of life and what David talked about preparing a table a, a banquet this is no happy meal this is a full-blown total complete blank uh, banquet uh, there's something in the Bible about the marriage supper of the lamb it was Jesus that went to that marriage supper it is Jesus that uh, took the five loaves, uh, you know, five sandwiches and two fish sticks and fed 5,000 adult men. I started counting the women and the children, so probably it could have been as many as 20,000 in that. Uh, the one miracle that's in every one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John only has seven of them. And feeding of the 5,000 is in it, John 6.35 and John 6.48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He is nourishment for a hungry world today. And I would venture to say today in America, we're hungry. First of all, we're hungry for truth. we got a bunch of lying liars lying to us. Congress, media, others, this and that. Uh, you know, Bill Gates trying to run the country, giving medical advice. What medical degree does Bill Gates have? I give him credit for being a great businessman and inventing Microsoft and all this kind of stuff. It's convenient. But, uh, you know, why are we surrendering to this man? Nobody gave him a boat, and he's got no medical degree. But he's determining and speaking, and people are, ooh, you know, Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates is an ungodly man who, by his own lips, has said, I'm an atheist. I do not believe that God exists. I pray for a salvation. It's not easy. I confess I'm human, <laughs> but I do pray for a salvation. But one day, he's going to find out that there is a God, one way or another. Like Blondie sang in that song, one way or another, we're going to get you, we're going to get you. <laughs> well, same thing to all those disbelievers, atheists, and agnostics who say there's no God. One way or another, they're going to know that God is real. And I hope it's on the right side of eternity. I've said yes to Jesus Christ. I've accepted him as my Savior. I deserve to go to hell. Not because I was an atheist. I never was. I was a skeptic. I was a disbeliever. I wanted nothing to do with God. I thought, I thought being a Christian was, was good for little sissy boys and girls and little old ladies. But a real man, a real woman don't need God. How wrong I was. I prayed to receive Jesus Christ. And I can tell you now, it takes a real man, a real woman to stand for God. To live for, for for the Lord. So what we see here is in the presence of my enemy, it says here he's prepared a table. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. And then the verse six is the capstone, the summary, great promises. Surely goodness and mercy 
Uh, the word mercy is hesed or loving kindness. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you catch the juxtaposition of life in this world on earth and our dwelling place in eternity in heaven? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life here when we have footprints and footsteps on planet earth. But then it says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The first readers that read this thought this meant the tabernacle or the temple but in reality, it does mean heaven, living and dwelling with God. Not just in a separate house, but in God's mansion, in one of the rooms. In one of the, it's going to be a big mansion. It's going to be a wonderful mansion. Those of us that have had loved ones that have passed, that are believers, be a grand, grand, grand reunion. Amen. So let's get into a couple of things about the, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, first thing, this is everybody's psalm. There are many psalms that are addressed here that are to the king or to the people or the temple hosts. Uh, they're designated as a psalm for somebody, some to the king. This one is, it, it's, it's everybody's psalm. There, nobody in particular that this psalm is to, which means this is my psalm and this is your psalm. Two, speaking of the possessive, notice the Lord, uh, it doesn't say the Lord is the shepherd. The, it doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. What does it say? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's like the confession of doubting Thomas in the book of John, chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, doubting Thomas, we call him because he was a skeptic. Uh, he was not there with the other disciples uh, when Jesus first appeared to his herd or group or the, the 11, the 11, before they appointed a new one. That happened in the book of Acts. Uh, Thomas wasn't there. He skipped out, bugged out. He was the first uh, Sunday night church absentee. Okay, <laughs> Thomas was the first church absentee. Uh, cut out from the fellowship, and uh, he thought it was all over. Jesus is dead and gone. He thought that he wasted his whole life in following this Galilean and a bunch of other fishermen following this Jesus, and it all ended bad. Uh, it seems so temporarily and on the surface, but Easter Sunday changed all that. And some way, somehow, Thomas missed out. And so when some of the disciples went to him uh, to invite him to the second Sunday church service in the so-called church age, uh, Thomas said, I ain't going. I, 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 he's dead and gone. I don't believe. Oh, they said, he's alive. We saw him. Thomas, smart aleck, wise guy. Uh, even though I call him smart aleck, wise guy, I respect the fact that he wanted real proof and real evidence and I respect the fact even more that once he saw the real proof and the evidence that he surrendered to God. There are some of you out there, you've seen the proof, you've seen the evidence, but you've yet to surrender to Christ. I challenge you to surrender to Christ. Back to Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas said this, Unless I stick my finger through the hole in his palms and stick my hand into the side, then I will not believe. I, I, I will not believe. And uh, guess what happens? Jesus shows up, and here's the beauty of the grace of God. Is Jesus uh, confronting Thomas in front of the other disciples and saying, Thomas, you turkey, you creep, you bozo, you idiot. He says, hey, <laughs> come on, reach, reach here and be believing. Commit yourself to me. Thomas gives the, probably the all-time, ultimate, greatest confession in the New Testament in John 20, 28. He doesn't say, the Lord, the God. He says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Out of his skepticism. And when he saw the truth and the proof and the evidence, he committed, he surrendered. Uh, another thing about Thomas, Thomas died on the mission field was martyred in India. 
He started churches in India. And I've had privilege, as I preached in India, to preach in many churches called the Martoma Church of India. The Martoma Church of India, which was started by Thomas, Doubting Thomas, and his followers and disciples and his legacy. I call Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas, then Pouting Thomas, and then Shouting Thomas. He <laughs> shouts, my Lord, my God. And so one of the things that we see about this 23rd Psalm is that it begins both with the Lord and ends with the Lord. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Second verse. It ends, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It begins and ends with the word Lord. There is the Lord. It's, I call it the Lord's sandwich. The Lord's sandwich. He, and we're in between. We're there with him. Uh, we see a couple, of, a couple of things I hear. We see, first of all, the presence of the shepherd. And then we see the promise of the Savior. The shepherd is also the Savior. But getting back to that, that topic and, and really the title of my message and the, the one key core truth I want to get across tonight is once again that word <coughs> through. We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death in some ways in America. If not physical death, perhaps the death of the American culture, perhaps the death of the American way. They're trying to change everything. They're trying to change all kinds of things here. And we need to stand up. And uh, this may be a, a, a disciplinary thing from God to call us back and to call us to him, to give us a, a second chance. And even though America is not Israel and a formal covenant nation like Israel, well, I, I believe God had a hand in the founding of America. God had a purpose for this nation. And it was founded on the Judeo-Christian principle. The signers of the Declaration of Independence covenanted together. And when the last two words of the Declaration of Independence were written, the word sacred honor, sacred honor, the Declaration of Independence begins with God as creator and ends with God, uses the word sovereign judge. It, it, it begins with God as creator. That's the book of Genesis. It ends with God as sovereign judge. That's the book of Revelation. I can make a case that our nation was founded on the Bible. Genesis, the Declaration of Independence. Genesis and Revelation. And then in between, there is providence. Providence. God moving. Providence is from the word pro-video. We know what a video is. It's to see. Pro means before. To see something before. God's providence. So, focusing in once again on verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. Think of it. It doesn't say that we are walking in circles. It doesn't say that we're stuck in the muck, in the mire of the valley of the shadow of death. But we walk through it. And we will walk through all this situation in our nation today, just some of the upheaval and what I call discombobulation and and all all the whatnot. And so, even though I walk through the valley of shadow, I will fear no evil, for you are present. Uh, not only do we walk through the valley of the shadow, but He walks with us. I would say He is holding our our hand in one hand, and in the other hand, He's got His rod and staff. To protect us, to lead us, to guide us. So we see just some some basic things uh, regarding uh, this this verse. Uh, overall, this shepherd psalm it was familiar in the ancient Near Middle East. The work of a shepherd. Many of those cultures were pastoral shepherd uh, society, and uh, even the kings uh, the kings. Uh, in ancient times, in the ancient Near East, compared themselves, and even though they were sovereign kings with their right of so-called royal blood, uh, the Bible says that we're all made of one blood, and by the way, the Bible says that we're all of one race on the inside. We're all of one race. That's in the book of Acts. Uh, that uh, 
the kings compared themselves to shepherds in their leadership capacity. And that's what a shepherd does, leads the, the sheep, uh, leads uh, the sheep. Uh, verse 2, I want you to notice, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Uh, these green pastures uh, talk uh, about uh, our rest, our rest and security in him, our, in the severity, their serenity. He leads us, uh, the, the Hebrew here says he re- leads uh, the sheep to tall grass so they can eat. He feeds them, he nourishes them. And then notice the next part, he leads me beside quiet still waters, quiet still waters to sip from. It's a picture of rest and peace, picture of satisfaction. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here is our, our walk. We have our worship and our walk in this passage of scripture in the ways that are right to to god uh, want us to realize as as we focus on this uh, the presence of the shepherd and then the promise of the shepherd we see a couple of things on our part we see our reliance on him in verses one through three our reliance and then we see our residence, our residence. We live and dwell uh, in the house of the Lord, so to speak. We have a spot. And notice the end of verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And there's an aspect of resurrection in this, eternal security and serenity. I, verse 6, I want us to notice the fullness and the finality of these promises. The fullness of all that God is in the place where God is. We will dwell with him forever. This ends with a, with a wonderful, wonderful forever. Verse 5, it says here that uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. This is the big, big, big banquet. The big, big, big banquet. And this is a symbolism of... Uh, laced with a lot of Old Testament views. I'm just going to run over a couple of them real quick. Uh, This is the symbolism of the Old Testament of Joseph. What did Joseph do? He fed this nation when there was a drought and there was a famine. And through his commitment to God and following up God's word, through his shrewdness and ingenuity, Joseph single-handedly provided food for his nation during a time during a time of total famine and while the world was starving, he set aside for the future food and and they ate. Uh, Jesus is a type of Joseph. I could do a whole series, uh, a whole sermon series on Jesus as Joseph. Uh, Joseph was uh, rejected by his brothers. Christ came unto his own, and his own knew him not, John 1.11. Uh, Joseph was sold. Joseph was sold for a pittance. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver by, by Judas. Jesus turned uh, the water to wine and expanded the bread and fed 5,000 males, 5,000 men. He's the bread Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Paul talked about the Great Supper. The book of Revelation talks about the end time marriage supper of the Lamb. And maybe the Baptists are on to something when they have all these potlucks with food. <laughs> food in the Bible is looked upon as a thing of blessing, a thing of fullness, a thing of presence. Uh, it guarantees non-famine and that Christ is our nourishment. So notice, I, I, you prepare a table be, before me. Uh, I want you to notice when you go back home tonight or tomorrow morning when you read this psalm, I want you to notice the contrast of the eyes, or us and God himself, the eyes and the he's, the eyes and the he's, or you, uh, in this just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful contrast. Here in this psalm, uh, there's sevenfold activity of the Lord. Sevenfold activity. Seven things that the Lord does, that the shepherd does for the sheep. Seven things. Now, it's amazing, once again, and maybe the number seven 
You've heard me harp on about the number seven, how it is an ideal number. And there is truth to numbers in the Bible, uh, biblical symbology. One is a number of God. Our God is one. He is, he is one. Two is a number of witness. Two is a number of witnesses. It talks about two witnesses uh, in the church if there's a complaint or an accusation of scandal against the shepherd or the pastor. There has to be two witnesses. Uh, the book of Revelation at the end time, uh, it talks about in the end time during the great tribulation, two witnesses that appear. Two is the number of witnesses. Three is the number of God, of course. Trinitarian, three and one, one and three, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. And, and then four actually is a number of, of earth and humanity. It, it's, it's the number of, of, of earth, four seasons, uh, you know, four northeast, southwest, four. Five is a number of judgment or God's movement, 50 days, 50 days, Pentecost. Uh, uh, seven is the number of perfection. It's three and four together, three representing God, four representing humanity, Three and four is seven. It's God and man working together. Seven is the number of man. Now, I forgot and left out one number. The number before seven is the number six. Six is uh, the number of sin or falling short. Uh, six falls short of the number of seven. Sin is described in Romans 3.23 as falling short of the glory of God. Six. And I don't have the time to go through all the things of the sixes uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, one, Only one, uh, book of Revelation, Matthew, uh, chapter 13, verse 18. There's the number of the devil, the beast. Uh, actually, it's a number of the Antichrist. And it is the number 666. Six, six. Another trinity, but an unholy trinity. 666 six, six, falls short of the perfect number 777. Seven, seven. By the way, 777 whips 666 every time. <laughs> it's worth saying again. 777 whips 666 every time. And if we're seeing 666 activity today in America, antichristic activity, just want you to know, 777 whips 666 every time. And even though you may feel a discomfort or a discombobulation, maybe a pit in your stomach, maybe some anxiety, maybe the news depresses you, and, and maybe in the news hearing about, you know, bottoming out the virus and herd immunity and so many getting shots and, and things, and uh, you're getting mixed messages, uh, you know, get your shots, wear two masks, and there's new strains coming. Uh, <laughs> I'm thankful that the Word of God is true and pure and unmixed. Yeah. is solid and true and straightforward. 777 whips 666 every time. And that 777 is our shepherd. David puts it in verse 1 as my shepherd. My shepherd, your shepherd. My <coughs> shepherd, your shepherd. So getting on the numbers, I got on the numbers because in this 23rd Psalm, there is six activities of the Lord God. Six, seven activities that God does. He makes, he leads, he restores, he guides, he is with us, he prepares a table, and he anoints our head. So getting to that anointing, verse 5 at the end, you have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Anointing of oil meant several things in the Old Testament economy. Those that read this uh, originally understand that. First, a king was anointed. Oil was put on his head as a symbol and representation of his being set aside. Oil was also, uh, prophets were anointed with, with oil. And uh, so we, uh, the, the, the anointing represents a refreshment from God and also an assignment from God and something to do for God. You have anointed my head with oil. And then he says, my cup overflows. Uh, once again, we see the presence of the shepherd, and then we see the promise of the Savior. 
We see the shepherd savior. The shepherd savior. We see that he restores us. He leads us and guides us in the paths of righteousness that he has revealed to us. And he sets a table uh, before the the presence of my enemies. Another meaning of table and banquet is fellowship, enjoyment. Uh, you're, you're sitting at a banquet at a table, you're with friends and family, and it's just a wonderful time. Generally speaking, you're not going to have hated enemies sitting at your Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, uh, you know, unless they're a relative, and that's a completely different story <laughs> and, and things, but you're not going to have enemies. And uh, here it's all of God's people at this wonderful banquet. It's a fellowship. It's a fellowship time. It's a togetherness. And so we see here that as we finish this and we see the, the last verses, uh, eternal security and serenity, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Uh, notice this part of verse 6, all the days of my life here. But then in the end, we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a, what, what a contrast. We have refreshment. We have guidance. We have protection. Uh, notice the rest for the restless that we have. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet water. He restores my soul. He, he guides me. Uh, by the quiet waters and the green pastures. Uh, this talks about rest and removal of our stresses and just, you know, in uh, giving all our cares to Him and having uh, this rest. Rest for the restless. And wouldn't you agree with me that today we're living in a time of real restlessness? Mm -hmm. I mean, any city can, can break out. Any city can break out in riots and burning of... Mm -hmm. Of buildings, any kind of a, a police shooting. And I support the local police. I spent time as a third uh, reserve deputy sheriff and uh, got involved uh, in police chaplaincy and things. I, I'm a supporter of your local police ever since I saw James Garner in the movie Support Your Local Sheriff. Okay, <laughs> ever since I, I, you know, I saw him uh, in, in that movie. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, we support, and we are living in a time of restlessness. Whoa, if there's another shooting tonight somewhere, and then burn the whole place down and things. Uh, I'm not going to get into the politics of it. Any loss of life is tragic, but you know what? No matter what color, no matter what skin, white, no matter what, you know what? If they weren't criminals... You wouldn't have a problem with the police, and neither would the police have a problem with them. Uh, we, we forget that. And there's a segment, and I'm going to politic a little bit. Don't get mad at me or shut off. If a white cop shoots a white person, no big deal. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm going to say next, so I don't even have to say it. <laughs> but this is the unpeace. This is the disillusion. This is the restlessness today in America. And it's because we are shutting God off in so many of our vectors in our nation. We need to come back to the shepherd. And in this, we have comfort and confidence. We need the shepherd, especially now. We always need the shepherd in our personal lives for comfort, for rest, for peace, for nourishment, for confidence, for trust. But we also need him in our nation. I want to read one verse and then I'll close in prayer. It's the verse Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 11. Isaiah 40 uh, begins a, a new section of the book of Isaiah. Here's a couple of things that those of you that are Bible scholars may already know, or if you love the Bible, you'll appreciate knowing this. Isaiah is the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. He's technically the greatest writing prophet, though Elijah is looked upon as the most powerful preaching prophet. He was not a writing prophet. Uh, we have the four major prophets, beginning with the prophetical books of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Ezekiel and Daniel. Remember Daniel in the lion's den mm -hmm. and Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego, the three that were in a fiery furnace. They had a fearless faith that faced a flaming fiery furnace. And Daniel in the lion's den had a fearless faith that faced a few famished felines. Uh, we see these great prophets. Isaiah is the greatest writing prophet. He is, uh, many scholars have called the book of Isaiah the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Isaiah. Because there's so many direct pro the prophecy of the virgin birth, 714. The prophecy of Christ dying on the cross, Isaiah 53. All kinds of, and here's, here's the amazing thing. Here's the wonderful unity and, and the structure and the architecture by the Holy Spirit of the Scripture. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 39 Old Testament chapters. New Testament, 27. Write those two numbers down. 39 Old Testament. New Testament, 27. The book of Isaiah is divided by two. The first 39 books relate much to the Old Testament and speak of some judgment things. Beginning in chapter 40, the last 27 books of the book of Isaiah are like the New Testament and really prophetically in type, shadow, and direct prophecy focus on Jesus Christ. Focus on Jesus Christ. I mean, amazing structure engineered by the Holy Spirit of Scripture. The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, written Word of God. And you can never dig in too deep and exhaust the wonders and its, its truth. So, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, uh, the, the New Testament part of the book of Isaiah begins, Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. In the Hebrew, it's Dabaru Alev Yerushalayim. It means speak kindly to the heart of Jerusalem. Beginning in chapter 40, after the prophet has these hard, rough messages, he begins to speak comforting messages to the heart Comfort, comfort my people. Psalm 23 is a psalm of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people. By the way, verse 3 of Isaiah 40, prophecy of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight uh, a highway for our God. That's a prophecy of John the, the Baptist, or some say John the Baptizers, who aren't Baptists. Our church is a Southern Baptist church. I'm proud to be a Baptist and a Southern Baptist. So I will call John the Baptist, John the Baptist, and not John the Baptizer. <clears throat> John the Baptist. But look at Psalm 40, 11. Like a shepherd. Like a, a what? Like a shepherd. Yes, yes, you're right. A shepherd. Like a shepherd. He will tend his flock. He will take care of us. Sometimes the shepherd may have flock shock. Sometimes you may have flock shock. Sometimes you may have pastor shock when you see he's on a step or, or off. But like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. His arm will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. That's a very tender hearted verse, you know. And even though I, you know, I used to be thinking that I was a tough guy when I was young and in the, in the service, you know what? I need a shepherd to hold me in his bosom and carry me. Uh, chapter 40 uh, attacks idol worship, idol worship. And even though today in America we don't worship idols per se like they did in the Old Testament or animist people in the jungles of South America or many places I've been in Africa, they, they worship idols and their idols, uh, and we talk about them being backward, and uh, uh, hey, there's idol worship in America, idol worship in America, idols of so many things, idols of this, idols of money, idols of power, idols of prestige, idols, idols, idols. The difference between the true God and an idol is that we carry idols, but God carries us. We carry idols, but 
God carries us. Look at verse 11 once again of chapter 40 of Isaiah. And then I'll, I'll wrap it up with closing prayer back to Psalm 23. Isaiah 40, 11. Like a shepherd, he will tend this flock. His arms will gather the lambs. That's you and me. He will carry them in his bosom. Uh, is that close to the heart? Close to the heart of God. We are on God's heart. We are on God's mind. And then it says, he will gently lead the nursing ewes. He will gently lead us. So let me let me close with prayer. God, God bless you. Uh, when you get down or discouraged or frustrated or see something on the news, I want to tell you, I've not been watching as much news as I used to. I used to be a big news junkie now i can't stand watching the news because i know they're lying i know they're lying but when we get down and when we get discouraged or we're in distress or we're experiencing anxiety psalm 23 is always a great psalm to go to go to the shepherd psalm and then go to the shepherd let's pray dear god i thank you for this short little psalm this psalm that throbs with relationships, throbs with your mercy and loving kindness. Lord, it throbs with our two residences. Here as we leave footprints and footsteps upon the earth and in your house where we will dwell with you forever and ever and ever. I thank you for the promises of this psalm. I thank you for your presence and your promise here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget Sunday, 1045 California time. Once again, on Facebook that you're watching on now. God bless you.